Welcome to God's Word for you today. We trust that your day went well today as we have been praying for you. It's good to see all of you. Shall we pray together? Father, in Jesus' precious name, once again, uh, we thank you tonight. What a privilege it is for us to come before your throne of grace and to ask for your blessing upon your word. Lord, we need your word tonight and we need the help of your Holy Spirit tonight to uh, teach us line by line, precept upon precepts. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you minister to all of us tonight, those who are joining, those who will join in, and those who will be hearing me later. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Welcome to God's Word for you today. I trust you all have your Bible. I welcome you all in Jesus' name. And uh, we will continue our studies in lessons from Divine Encounters. Uh, you remember uh, for many months now, that's been our subject. And we just thank the Lord for all that we are learning. For the past few weeks, we have been talking and deliberating and learning the conversation between uh, Jesus and Nicodemus. And uh, it's interestingly, we find a lot in that private meeting. We're so grateful that that private meeting uh, is available to all of us. Uh, in these meetings, uh, especially where we're going to be looking at today, were certain things the Lord um, reveal in that, in that uh, conversation that becomes an underlining and fundamental doctrines and teachings of the church. It is my prayer today that the Lord will bless you with the understanding of his word. So John chapter 3 and verse 1 we read, I trust you have your Bible with you. We're going to need your Bible tonight. John chapter 3, verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, 
the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We'll stop right there and we will take off from where we stopped last week. Well, what a pleasure again to uh, in, invite you in the presence of the Lord as we uh, deliberate on his word tonight. It's good to have all of you. And as you uh, open your Bible, I pray that God will open your heart, that you might be able to receive whatever it is that you need for your journey. Um, last week, we mentioned Jewish elders refused Jesus' testimony about himself and the kingdom of God. There was no excuse to have rejected the testimony if they had applied the law of witness from their own scripture. And what is that law of witness? Now, the, 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 one of the main reasons why anyone will not want to accept anything, and the Bible tells us not to accept everything, but to, to try every spirit and to make sure it is from God. So when people start to uh, tell you this and that, and that, you know, you need to know how to be able to uh, ascertain uh, truth. So th there was a law that God gave Israel in ascertaining the truth. And this law, the, the principle from this law can be used in trying to understand what is truth. In Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, I'm reading the New Living Translation. It says, you must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The fact of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, this is a very important law that protects a man from being judged based only on a single witness. It is a good principle to judge what the truth is. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 18 verse 16, uh, the Amplified Version says, uh, uh, Jesus was talking about if there is a problem between you and your brother and you've tried to talk to him and, you know, he's not listening. Then Jesus said in verse 16, he said, but if he does not listen, take along with you one or two others so that every word may be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So now you, you see, uh, Jesus also referred to that same principle from the Old Testament. Now the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinthians, in his second letter, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, he said these words, This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of two or three witnesses, Every word shall be established. Again, that principle is there. And so if, if, if they were concerned about uh, Jesus coming from nowhere and they do not know, uh, you know, where his source uh, was from, there are ways you can test, you know, what he is teaching, uh, what he has said, uh, but Jesus, Jesus said, look, we, we, in other words, myself and the others, we have, we, we spoke what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But you refuse our testimonies. There is no, there is no excuse for anyone. You know, there are people who will say, well, you know, the church is full of hypocrites. That's why they're not gone. Well, you know, uh, that's not good enough excuse because the, so is the mall. 
The mall is also full of hypocrites. So the restaurants are also full of hypocrites. The bars are, and uh, uh, where you, 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 you go to have fun is also full of hypocrites. But that doesn't stop you. So uh, that's not going to be a good enough excuse or reason for you when you stand before the Lord. There are ways you can ascertain the truth. Now, Jesus is charging this, this Pharisee and his peers that, you know, um, you have rejected the testament. There's a way you can tell. The scriptures themselves testify of me. In John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus said to them also, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. If you read your Bible very well, you find the truth. If you have read the scriptures that you had, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, you know, all of these spoke of me. Moses spoke of me. You know, Abraham saw my day. Every page of the scripture speaks about me. And that is testimony in itself. So you need another one. By the mouth of two or three witnesses. The witness of scripture, that's one testimony. John the Baptist, uh, uh, you know, John said, John said, I saw Jesus, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John said, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. In other words, he just didn't show up. You know, he was before me. This man is the ancient of days. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. The reason why I have this ministry is to reveal him. You know, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day John stood with two of his disciples and they and then he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak. And they followed Jesus. You know, those two disciples followed Jesus from that uh, place where Jesus was baptized. And John introduced him. So now, you had the testimony of the scripture. You had the testimony of John the Baptist. And the Pharisees were around to hear all of this. And, and with all of these, they rejected. And so there was no excuse. Because those two disciples, you know, heard the same thing. And they followed Jesus. So this is what Jesus meant by, you know, we speak, you know, what we know. We testify of what we have seen. But you have refused our testimony. And there are so many today that refuse the testimony. Yeah, they say the church is corrupt. The church is full of hypocrites. Uh, people, you know, some, some of the elders there, they take your money. They, 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 and all of that may be true. But is there still the truth? Is there some place where that is not the case? Is there a church where you can go and you can meet the Lord? You know, the truth is still here in spite of all of that. So don't let anything uh, be a hang up for you not to pursue the Lord. You know, don't let, don't let anyone or anything be a reason why you will not give your life to the Lord. You know, there will always, you know, there will always be a bad representative of anything. You know, when you see a nice fruit tree, you know, as sweet as a, a fruit can be on that tree, you're going to see another tree, uh, another fruit that is rotten, that is full of worms, but it doesn't stop you from eating from the rest of the tree. So there was no excuse. Uh, Jesus said, you, you know, by the, by the mouth of two or three, 
uh, witnesses, every matter should be established. So uh, because the Pharisees were trained, uh, in, they were trained and they were supposed to be the one who already have a systematic you know, uh, theology. They, they know how they can tell. And, and, and it's not even that they don't know. This is not a matter of ignorance because Nicodemus confessed, we know, we know that thou art a teacher come from God and that should settle it. That is the testimony they needed. Why did they then refuse the testimony of Jesus? Well, in their efforts to be conservative, they became preservative and they fought the very life that they needed. They needed, they were all their life, all they had was an empty box, empty box, and they carried it, they cherished it, they pride themselves in carrying an empty box. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy that box or take that box away. Actually, I came to fill it. I came to put substance in it. I came to give meaning to everything that you have uh, all believed and held there too. So now that was the testimony of scriptures, testimony of John the Baptist. Even those two disciples that follow, you know, one of them, Andrew, uh, it says about Andrew in John 1, 40, uh, uh, 1 verse 40, it says one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. If, if Andrew could find the Messiah, the Pharisees could have found the Messiah. This is what Jesus meant by, you know, you have not received our testimony. You know, so there was something else. Uh, it was not about Jesus. It was not about what he thought. It was about themselves. You know, they, it, it, they have become political, you know, and it's a dangerous mix every time that religion mix with politi politics. You have a man standing before Jesus who was a politician, who was a, a priest and also a professor. And uh, he wear many hats. He was a distinguished, notable man in Israel, especially an expert in the law of of Moses. So um, that's what Jesus meant in verse 12. Jesus now uh, said something that now uh, it helped us to understand where the, the real point. See, this is, this is diagnostics because uh, we could never have known what the problem was except Jesus let us know. So uh, you follow the conversation and you follow uh, up till this point G uh, Nicodemus had been going back and forth. Uh, there was in a, the expression of confusion. He was marveling. He, he was so confused because he was hearing some of these things for the first time. And then not only was he hearing them for the first time, he was hearing these things in absolute terms. In other words, Jesus was not leaving any options or any other. Jesus was saying unless. Uh, Jesus was saying except. Jesus was saying must. Uh, you know, and so the, there was no other way to to understand this or interpret it. And those things still remain up till today. So Jesus now said, "Look, uh, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things?" Now. Uh, have you ever thought uh, in this whole dialogue that the problem uh, may not actually be lack of understanding? Uh, the problem may just be belief. And so if that you can think well, I can use that same thing to ask myself a question. Sometimes it's not that I don't understand. Could it be just uh, that uh, maybe I don't believe? That is a serious problem. That may be the problem, my friends. 
you know, my beloved, it may just be the problem of um, um, unbelief. You know, someone said, it is not what I don't know about the Bible, the Word of God, that bothers me. Uh, it is what I know that bothers me. It's not what I don't know that bothers me. It is what I know. So now, could it be that all these, you know, uh, up and down with Nicodemus now, it is just now because, I mean, he, he, he was an intelligent man. He was studious. He was an educated man. Well, the purpose of education really, uh, after you have gotten education, all that has done for you is to make you teachable. That's, that's, that's the advantage of education, that, that you are now able, you're taught, you're given a foundation to be able to understand precepts and ideas, and uh, you are able to put things together, or at least you know where to find things and where to put things. That is the purpose of education. And so um, this man had been trained in this way to be able to understand. But obviously, we saw in the beginning that he didn't understand. And now Jesus now is pointing out something else. And Jesus is not, did not say, in verse 12, Jesus did not say, if I have told you earthly things that you do not understand. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. So I want you to, to keep this word now in mind because it's all about belief now. Every other thing that Jesus will say now and later will, it will rally around this word. So my, my beloved, as you're listening tonight, um, would you check your belief quotient tonight? The problem may just be your your unbelief. So would you check check where you are? You know, with with your faith tonight, with your belief. It may not just be that you don't. Un you you may actually understand. Some of you and some of us have been in ch around church for so long. So we may actually understand, and we are not too unfamiliar with some of these things. But could it be, like Nicodemus, that the problem is with belief or un unbelief? Now, Jesus said, you know, I have tried to speak to you in plain style, using the simplest illustration and similitudes, and you do not understand, uh, you know, or you do not believe what I have said to you. What would you do if I speak to you heavenly things? Verse 13, Jesus talked about no one has ascended to heaven, uh, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Um, verse 14, now Jesus goes into uh, to capture uh, this man's attention. You know, Jesus now said from verse 14, uh, you will notice that if, you, if you're looking, uh, you know, it goes all the way to verse 17. Uh, so let us let us read verse 14, John 3, and in verse in verse 14, Jesus said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. You know, um, we've been really eager to come to this verse 16, this most popular verse of the scripture. John 3, 16. But let's take our time to uh, see what led to that statement. It was a great revelation today. It was a revelation that eventually changed uh, this Pharisee. It was something to know. And this, 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 the understanding of these verse 
is the power that is changing the life of many even up till today. There is one thing there that God, God loves. That God, God loves. Let's get into verse 14. And I want you uh, just to pay attention as we dive uh, deeper into uh, these words tonight. So, uh, Jesus now changed, changed uh, the trajectory because so Jesus, knowing that this man, was an expert of the Old Testament. He will know if you bring a story up. And by the way, this story here was very, it's a popular story that every, even the Jewish, you know, children uh, uh, will know this story. In verse 14, Jesus said these words, and as, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I want you to notice, you know, a few things in that verse. First of all, uh, this is as. Je Jesus was comparing what will happen to him uh, to what happened in this story. Now, this was an actual, actual event. And so this man's mind reverses back to that story. I want you to just, if you can, underline certain things that we must take out of this verse. Ask Moses. That's number one. The other word there to, to be noted is lifted up the serpent. If you underline that, that makes uh, number two. Uh, even so must, so must, so must, that's, that needs to be underlined because this word must is coming back again. Remember, Jesus had been using this word, uh, most assuredly, unless one is born again, he cannot see and said, don't marvel that I said you must be born again. So let's underline that word must. And then uh, the other word is be lifted up again. The first lifted up was the lifted up the serpent. But now the son of man be lifted up. That's another word to underline to see. And then the last one there is eternal life. So let's, let's now um, go back and, and take those words and try to understand as Moses. So Jesus is drawing a parallel. And isn't that true that, you know, the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come you know it is it is the old, old testament that reveals or uh, gives us a picture of what god is going to do in the future same thing uh, god asked abraham to go up that mountain to sacrifice his son it was a picture uh, noah's ark was a picture you know notice that noah's ark was to um, preserve people against the judgment of the flood those who were in the ark anyone who came in the ark was saved that ark itself is a type uh, of jesus uh, that saved us from the judgment to come anyone that comes in the ark you know if you come on in the ark you will be saved you will be saved from uh, the judgment that is coming and so we see the the passover lamb it's also a, a, a type and a shadow and so and so here also we we see that type uh in this story so as moses uh as moses in other words you know this is a picture of what was happening in this Old Testament scripture was a picture of what God uh, intended to do, uh, gives, gives us a foreshadow of the sacrifice of Christ. Then the word lifted up the serpent. Now, um, I think maybe at this point, you know, I, let's, let's just read this story and then we'll come back to these highlights 
uh, so that, you know, when I refer to something in the story, you will already know the story. The story is found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Uh, Numbers 21, verse 4 through 9. Let me just read that to you. He said, Then they journey from Mount Ho by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fairy serpents among the people, and they beat the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall leave. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So here in this Old Testament passage, the children of Israel were attacked by poisonous snakes as a result of their sin. Thousands of them died. The people cried to Moses for help, and Moses consulted God on their behalf. And God instructed Moses to make an image of a snake and mount it on a pole. It's to be made out of bronze. Anyone who looked at the snake was cured from the bite and they lived. This event, this event was God painting the picture of Calvary, a foreshadow of the sacrifice of Christ, of how salvation will be brought to mankind through Christ. So now, We'll go back to those highlights. The first highlight is as Moses. That we understand now that it's, it's a parallel uh, of what will happen. J Jesus is now talking to Nicodemus. And he said what happened in history is going to happen you know, now uh, in, 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 in the present. Because this is what's going to happen to the Son of Man. So the other word is lifted up. The serpent. Now the, we have read the story. Notice that there were serpents that were, were beating, biting them, and God instructed Moses to make uh, a bronze serpent. So uh, that is why the, the word is used here, the serpent. It's not one of those that was, uh, you know, biting them. It was an image of it. So that's why it's the serpent. Okay, and then the other word we highlighted is the must. Uh, this is not the first time in this conversation Jesus will use this must. And that's one of the source of Nicodemus' confusion. Because Jesus was saying, unless must, accept, you know. So there were, these are absolute terms. So here, this one man at, at a night meeting with Jesus got a revelation that God was about to do, even though he may not get the full picture and understand because he was still in the process of understanding, Jesus revealed to him the heart of God, what was going to happen with Jesus' life. It's a must, the necessity of Jesus' redemption, the necessity of the cross, the necessity of him dying. There will be no, you know, no option, no negotiation. God has willed that Jesus will die for us. Jesus himself had willed that he will lay down his life. So he said, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, uh, he will be lifted up also as the serpent was lifted up. That's the other word. 
And then the purpose of this is that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Notice, when Jesus used these words, uh, lifted up, and then he says, son of man. Son of man is a, a messianic title that Jesus used to refer to himself. And then we have the word eternal life. Eternal life is the life of God himself. It's life everlasting. And so the term, the serpent, all of these you know, that we highlight, all of these will mean something to Nicodemus because he, he knew the story very well. The story is familiar to every Jew, especially the scholars. Therefore, Nicodemus easily could understand the references that Jesus was making by using those terms, you know, in, in that story. Now, um, so we, we've read the story and you know just about the story. They were dying because of, from the poison of the snakes. And so, um, get the picture now. Get, get the picture of what happened in the Old Testament. Get the picture. So the people were dying. Once you're, once you're beaten and the snake had deposited that venom in you, my friend, you are on, you're dying. You are on your way to the, and all of these is a type of, of sin and death and redemption, uh, the, the sacrifice, salvation, all of that, that's what it means. But notice that they had to trust in something beyond themselves. In other words, once you were beaten, there's nothing you can do. There was nothing you can do for yourself. Now, I, I'm very sure there are some of them who will be, you know, snake handlers and, you know, they know what to do. They have been beaten by snakes before, uh, but not like this one. This one was a judgment and therefore there was no remedy. There was nothing they can do to redeem themselves. I don't know if you have ever uh, seen anyone fall into what you call a murray, uh, you know, a, 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 a sand, a sand pit, a, you know, sinking sand. You know, uh, the more that person try to help themselves, the more they drown, the more they go in. If they will be safe at all, they're going to need help from the outside. They're going to need help from the outside because the more they try, the more they go down. And that is the nature of sin and the sinner. There is nothing a sinner can do on, on, his, on his own. It's got to be a help from, from the outside. Notice, they could not do anything. They had to trust, not in what they can do, they are, the works they can do, but they have to trust in something beyond themselves. In Titus 3 and verse 5, it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Uh, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. In, uh, I, I was saying there is nothing they could do, just like a man who falls into a quicksand. Once, once, once the more he tries, the, the more. So, uh, isn't this interesting though, that all they had to do, all they had to do was just what God prescribed to, to leave. All right? There was nothing that they could do on their own. Uh, you know, the, the, the Bible reminds us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. They had to trust in what God provided, and that is something beyond themselves. Also, uh, this was the only hope. There was no other alternative. They could not look elsewhere, else, elsewhere to be saved. They could not look elsewhere to be saved. Only to that bronze serpent that was lifted for them. The idea of being healed simply by looking at the bronze snake 
seemed ridiculous, but it was the remedy. People may argue it, people may say, you know, what does this mean? How will this work? You know, it was the remedy that God gave. First Corinthians 1 verse 18, the apostles say, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, and don't you know that the bronze snake obviously has no power in itself. It is proof that this is power of God. And my friend, look, even in the Old Testament, God was teaching the people the principles and the doctrines of faith. That no one can save themselves, not by works of righteousness. That is just, it just simply fit. Meaning, think about it, my friend. Looking up was an act of fate. Now, somebody has been beaten and they're dying, and the prescription is just look. I mean, you were not to do any other thing except just to look at that bronze serpent lifted up. Notice, notice something here. Looking up was an act of fate. Faith is taking God at his word. In other words, doing just what God said. It may not make sense that, you know, how does the, you know, the venom inside of you will be, will be cured just by you turning your eyes on something. That is exactly what it is. Looking up was an act of faith. And faith is taking God at his word. See, looking up was an act of faith because faith does not ask how it will be done. But believe it will be done. That's what faith is. God was teaching them faith. Faith to triumph over their works. Faith will bring salvation. Faith will bring be the reason why anyone is saved. Just like it says of Abraham also in Genesis, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted for him for righteousness, not of works. And, and so anyone who will walk with God will have to walk in faith. We're justified by faith. The just shall live by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Looking up was an act of faith. It was simple, but it was just the remedy. Now, I say faith does not ask how it will be done. Faith believes it will be done. Now, notice, notice this also from these experience that faith is a spiritual act. Faith is a spiritual act. Faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is what is used to transact between the spiritual realm and the physical realm, between God and, and man. Notice that those who looked up lived. Those who looked up lived. For some, some reason, when you take your eyes and put it on that, that lifted up serpent, something, something happened. There is an exchange. There is a transaction somehow that, you know, they were healed supernaturally. They were healed divinely. That makes us think then what divine healing is. Divine healing is spiritual. Divine healing does not need help. It, it comes. Because they obey, because they have faith in God's method. And isn't that exactly, exactly what it's required now? And remember, that's all that Nicodemus needed to know. Remember, this question came, how can these things be? How can a man be born again uh, when he's old? Will a man go back? You know, Nicodemus was, was caught up in the natural process of 
how a man is born. Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. And now, so Jesus now, uh, you know, bring these uh, Old Testament event, which he understood very well, that how were those people healed? They were not healed by any kind of injection. They were not healed by taking any, any pills. They were, not, they were supernatural healed. As long as they take their eyes, the fact that they put in their eyes and they lifted up bronze up, and meaning they are trusting, meaning they are believing in God's method, meaning that they are receiving God's prescription, and supernaturally, spiritually, their healing was received. And that's the only way we receive, you know, divine healing. We receive divine healing by trusting in God's word. My friend, can you understand it now? Faith in Christ is not walk or something we do. Uh, faith is just believing in him. And remember, when we get inside uh, this story, the, the last thing Jesus said to Nicodemus, I have told you earthly things you do not believe. I, what would you do now if I tell you spiritual things? It's about belief. It's about belief. Do you know also that there were many people who did not leave, who died in that wilderness, all because they will not look up? Oh, my friends, look up and leave. Look up and leave. Look up to the Son of Man who's lifted up, and you will leave. Looking up was an act of faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith does not ask how it will be done. Faith believes it will be done. Faith is a spiritual act. Faith is how we transact between earth and heaven. Notice, notice, uh, the serpent uh, that was the cause of their problem was also what was lifted up but notice when when you when the snake bites what the snake does is to deposit inject a venom that venom uh, th there is there is a biochemical reaction in the body that in the body that leads to death you know there's some venom that destroy the muscles and uh, some venoms if, if that uh, is if the snake puncture your vessel you know, uh, the blood, you know, leaks. Some people bleed to death because a vein is punctured. Or there are some venom that attacks the nervous system. Uh, you know, when, when, when you're beaten by a poisonous snake, you are dying. You're in that process. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 says, The sting of death is sin. And all of, them have, all of us have been stung. We are dying. We carry this death in us. We are living every day in the shadow of death. Why? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Now Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned. All of us have this venom in us. The sin and it's leading us to to death. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. We, we are sentenced and condemned to death. We carry it in our body. That is why every man alive dies. It's in us. But in that verse also, the other part of that verse the, 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 the wonderful part, the better part of that verse, Romans 6.23. It says, for the wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go back to that Old Testament event. The people have been beaten. You know, they're carrying that venom around. They are dying. But there is an option. There is an alternative, you know. I want you to, you know, just think with me for, for, for a moment. So you have people who are beaten and are dying because of the venom. 
God did not, you know, uh, provide anything that they can drink, they can eat, or they can do that, that, nothing. But God provided that serpent, and it was an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, it's also called salvation, but not, you know, and someone said God did not provide salvation, God provided opportunity. And that's all they needed to do. So there is an option. And my friends, can I tell you something wonderful tonight? Jesus is our option. In everything is our option. Jesus has become an option. You see, you don't have to be a sinner anymore. Jesus died so that you can be a saint. He's your option. You don't have you know, to live in sin anymore. Jesus, in Christ, you have liberty over sin. You know, in Christ, you, you have that option. You don't have to be a, a sick anymore. Jesus bore those stripes. He is our option. He is our option. Now, people who are dying, who look up, who will look up, and people who are dying from because of sin, who will look up, he is the option. The wages of sin is dead, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friend, what, what, what does it mean? Well, it was a serpent who brought their problem. God now said, make a similitude of that serpent and put it on the cross. There is something, you know, about that that is healing for them. And you know that that symbol of a serpent on the pole is the universal symbol for the medical uh, association all around the world today. You know, if Second Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one. Uh, it says, "For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He made him." Who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God? Uh, did you see that? You know, uh, he made him. He is now the ember. You know, uh, that's that that serpent was made out of bronze. Bronze is typical of judgment in the Bible. Serpent is usually a symbol of sin. And evil. It, our sin had been judged over there. And God has given us the opportunity, a way out to leave. That decision we have to make. My friends, see the parallel between the bronze serpent that was lifted up and the son of man, Jesus, who will be lifted up. Notice that the, the serpent was only needed because... First of all, the people had sinned against God. And so also, uh, Jesus is lifted up for us because of our sin. Secondly, the second parallel is that uh, the people were in danger of death because of sin. They have been, they have been bitten by those serpents. We are also in danger of sin and dying because we inherited uh, sin from Adam. Totally, uh, God provided a means of salvation and that salvation was lifted up for them. So also God provided for us today it means, you know, Jesus went into all of these stories to be able to help Nicodemus to understand when when he said how can these things be because you see he was from the school of walks he was from the school of ritual he was from the school of what can I do to inherit life now Jesus is saying there's nothing you can do just like those people, there's nothing they could do there was nothing they could do or come up with there was no other hope the only hope was just to look at what God has provided for them. Uh, my friends, uh, God provided a means of salvation 
uh, for them and the bronze serpent, they had to look at it. We also have to look at the Son of Man who uh, was lifted up for us. Another parallel is that the people were saved by looking at. It's just an act of faith and obedience. Same thing we have to um, do. Now, now there, there, that is the parallel. That is the similarity. But then I want to point out a, a diff some differences. The bronze serpent was just a piece of bronze with no power in itself to save. Unlike Jesus, who has power in himself to save, because he himself is life. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. His name is life. Just his name is life. So in that, he is greater than that bronze serpent. In fact, you know, the, the bronze serpent, uh, at the point in time, uh, the king Hezekiah, that righteous king, destroyed it and you will read that in second kings chapter 18 verse 4 uh it talked about what king Ezekiah did it says he removed the high places of pagan worship broke down the images the memorial stones and cut down the ashram he also crushed to pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days the Israelites had borne incense to it, and it, it was called Neshutan, that is a, a bronze sculpture. You know, so at the point in time, you know, it became a distraction. People started worshiping it, and, uh, you know, the king destroyed it because it became, you know, a symbol of idolatry. So the, 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 it was just a, a piece of bronze. But Jesus has life in himself. Not only, not only that, you know, the serpent has no, no, the, the, no drawing power. But the Son of Man has drawing power. Many thousands have been drawn by the cross. Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The lifted up bronze serpent brought healing and extended the physical lives of the people. The Son of Man brings healing, redemption, and he gave us eternal life. The bronze supper was to extend physical life, but the Son of Man gives us eternal life. So, my friends, um, it is, it's wonderful to get into to this uh, conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus to find out how Jesus helped this man to understand what we now, you know, enjoy and take for granted. My friends, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We'll continue from here next week. I trust that the Lord had uh, blessed you tonight. Shall we pray together? Father, in Jesus' precious name, how grateful we are to uh, come to study your word tonight and to understand, uh, just as our Lord explained to Nicodemus, so he could understand the love of God. Lord, we are so grateful, Lord, for your grace. We thank you for, for redeeming us, for rescuing us from the venom of sin. Thank you, Lord, for the lifted up Savior who became the atonement for our sin. And Lord, tonight, by faith, we also, we look up to him. We look up to him from whom our redemption, our salvation come from. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you provided for us. Lord, we thank you for the options that you have. Lord, there was no other hope. There is no other, uh, other help anywhere except that which you have provided. And we do thank you. We bless you. We give you praise. And Lord, we will praise you forever. Thank you tonight. I ask your blessing upon your people, especially those who need your power to be revealed.
to them and manifest it in their life and circumstances. I receive that breakthrough for them tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. My friend, are you out there and you have not looked up? This is all you have to do. God loves you and he's giving his son, that one who was lifted up on the cross of Calvary. That's all you've got to do. You also look and you will leave. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. If you will call upon the name of Jesus tonight, he will answer you. Just say this prayer with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Lord, I praise you tonight. I come in the name of Jesus. I am sorry for my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. Tonight, I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Lord Jesus, I give my heart to you. I ask that you be my Lord and my Savior. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thank you. Please write my name in the book of life. I commit my future into your hands today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If you're blessed by this teaching, share it, leave comments, and uh, uh, just help us reach people everywhere with the message of hope. Thank you.